Hello, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak um, at this conference. My name is Jill Hedcord. I am the Chief Medical Officer of Optum Genomics. I'm a board certified pathologist with subspecialty boards in molecular genetic pathology and an additional fellowship in pathology, oncology, informatics. Um, that's a really long way of saying that um, my expertise is in the design, validation, and implementation of um, clinical lab tests or in vitro diagnostic devices. Um, and I, I recognize that the, the device that we're talking about today is more of a traditional medical device, but a lot of what I'm talking about, about how do you um, develop the evidence and the evidence narrative um, to ensure the quickest possible route to widespread adoption and coverage of your device. It applies to um, in vitro diagnostics, to traditional medical devices, to um, medical apps, to um, software as, as a medical device. So that it's kind of the same cadence and the same recipe works for, for all of these types of products. Um, we've got the, the added um, complexity in clinical lab space or precision medicine space, where there's kind of a regulatory loophole for these tests. Um, they're called laboratory developed tests, and they actually don't have to go through the FDA um, prior to, be, to going on the market. Um, and so we've kind of got some additional de degrees of freedom and, and Wild West, which makes this evidence development and narrative um, process even more of an imperative. Um, and regardless of what kind of device you are, uh, it is estimated that it takes 14 to 17 years to get a health product from product concept to widespread coverage and adoption. And um, I mean, there's two reasons for this, basically. One is that you do have to have a lot of evidence that this device is safe, that it works reliably and reproducibly, um, and that it provides some kind of beneficial outcome. And depending on your intended use, you know, that can take a very long time to build that body of evidence. However, it's been my experience that this time to, to widespread adoption is lengthened because oftentimes the test developers are um, coming from a space where they're not familiar with the market access complexities of getting in getting a health product um, adopted. And but you know usually like uh, you know research scientists or, um, and or physicians who have really just you know focused on, their practice and, and or, or academic practice at, rather than somebody who's been in industry. And, um, you know, having been that kind of physician before, I know that I didn't know this stuff. They don't teach it to you in med school. Um, but there is an entire strategy around how you develop your evidence, what kind of evidence you need, why do you need that evidence, and how do you tell that story? And so that's kind of more what we're going to um, talk about in these next 10 minutes or so. Um, and hopefully, you know, that these are the kind of strategies that can move this 14 to 17 years into something that's more like, uh, you know, hopefully five to 10 years, depending, again, on your intended use. This slide is, um, uh, you know, what I work on every day, which is the in vitro uh, diagnostic medical device type. Um, and I've got this kind of set up in a, in a vertical stack. Uh, the next slide is going to be just the generic medical device, and it's going to be on an x-axis, but it's kind of all of the same information. And it's kind of the same basic evidence content that you would need um, to make a compelling story to a stakeholder like a professional society group or um, a health plan payer, um, medical director. Um, so first of all, and this is a step that gets skipped more often than one might think. What is the test intended use? Um, and it, it's um, common, I think, for people to, to approach um, a health products with a technology, um, you know, whatever it was that they worked on in grad school or postdoc or, um, you know, is some kind of technology that they're very excited about and then come in and, and look for a problem. Uh, and usually the more successful route is that if you actually identify a problem, characterize that problem, and then come up with a solution that is best fit to solve that problem rather than letting the technology lead. In this case, I understand, right, the technology is kind of already baked and mature, and now it's a matter of, you know, what are the different applications, what are the different intended uses, and what is the evidence that we need to get there? Um, and I, 
I believe in many ways, the, the I know that there have been some FDA authorizations for this technology. So this kind of concept of analytical validity, you know, does my test work, um, has been established at least, you know, for certain intended uses. Biomarker is, I don't think, applicable to this particular device. Um, and this is the clinical validity step. It would only be applicable if you're, if you're trying to predict something, predict an adverse event, predict response to a drug, predict a likelihood to get a disease. And that, that's a measurement of the predictive ability. In the precision medicine space, this evidence step is the one that is most often skipped and people try to go straight to the clinical utility. Um, and they spend a lot of money and a lot of time doing a clinical utility trial based on faulty information and, and didn't design their, their clinical trial properly to pick up their signal because they overestimated the predictability of their biomarker. Um, and I think that's just informative of um, how people can kind of waste time and, and money and resources in this process, evidence development process, by thinking that you could take a shortcut. Um, but I, I, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've never seen a health product succeed that tries to take an evidence shortcut. You might get some short-term win, but eventually it catches up to you and, um, and it'll fall apart. And you may have hurt a lot of people inadvertently um, in, that, in that time period by trying to skip the steps. Um, but clinical utility very much applies to um, uh, focus ultrasound um, and the specific intended uses. Um, and this is determined, unlike the, the validity, like does the instrument work, is kind of in the purview of the FDA. The clinical utility is determined by the payers and the individual physicians and professional societies. And this is where it can get a little tricky, right? The, the validity studies are kind of a recipe. Um, and there's not a lot of room for interpretation. Like, this is how you have to set up the study, and these are the outputs that you have to have. You don't get to like, well, what if I want a different output? You, like, it just is what it is. Clinical utility, very, what, what you need to measure and what is the right study design is going to be different depending on the test intended use. So there is no one-size-fits-all answer. Um, but this is where you want to be able to get um, feedback early and often. Um, from clinical champions, you want to, who can help you get um, information around, you know, what are the right endpoints, then do your study design, um, and then take that in front of the stakeholders, right? Then go get feedback from the payers early and often. Are these the right outcomes? Are these the kind of outcomes that would um, impact your decision making? Are we missing an outcome that you would need to see? Is the timeline for our you know, data collection points, the right interval of, of timelines. So, um, and there are ways and there's consulting groups and like my group helps with these in vitro diagnostic tests actually get that, that um, payer and provider feedback. Um, and in doing so, you can actually shorten your time to that um, coverage determination and not be surprised on the other end of your clinical trial that it wasn't appropriately powered or that it didn't answer a key question that the stakeholders would need to see. This is that same graph, but now it's laid out horizontally on the excess axis and applied to the medical development process in general. And um, I really like this paper and um, it, it's a, a paper about um, how medical experts need to be engaging more in the devi early device development process um, the one thing that I do have uh, that I would change a little bit about this graph is so it's here it's showing the like preclinical phases of, of proving that the instrument works for what you want it to do and that it's reliable and reproducible. And then these are your, your uh, phase one, two, and three clinical trials um, as needed. And um, it has market access starting here at the end of phase three. And I would actually argue that if you want this to go fast and as fast as possible, you need to start doing your, some people call it early market access or market development work really all the way back, you know, as soon as your basic research looks like this is something that might work. You want to be engaging um, technical key opinion leaders, even as you're still working out the technical capability of this device and have them partic in your, participate in, in your validation studies and then get them on a technical podium um, telling that story about the reliability and reproducibility of this technology. Um, and you wanna be thinking early on before you get to these um, clinical trials, 
who are the key opinion, who are my clinical champions? Who are the clinical key opinion leaders that I'm going to want to work with? Um, and be planning, you know, two, three years ahead, because you want to make sure that when your evidence drops, that you're, you, you're ready and hot off the press to go onto the right podium um, with the right key opinion leader to tell that story. You also want to start thinking about um, a lot of other market access needs very early in your process as well. Um, so this is why it's, yes, you need to have the evidence and understand why you need the evidence, but you also need to have a, a go-to-market strategy as well. And that includes things like, you know, when you're at the very beginning of the process, right, is this a good product market fit? Is there a clinical need? Validating that there's a clinical need. Um, and then, you know, quantitating, what is the opportunity here? Like, what is my total addressable market? What are the competing uh, technologies or or devices that are being used at um, at that point in care, and um, how much of that market do I think that this test can win? These are all things that you need to model out as um, you know to even make sure that this is a viable thing that you should be investing your time in. Um, you got to make sure that there's a place that it's going to fit into the healthcare system at the end. Um, and again, this concept of, of the key opinion leaders um, thinking ahead about what podiums you want to be on. Um, coding coverage and reimbursement. Start thinking about that early, as early as you can. Um, and there, there. I wish I could give you a one size fits all strategy for for how to do this, but um, it, it really is. You have to work with somebody who's got experience in in your device type to to understand all the nuances of um, which kind of CPT code you want, which fee schedule are you going to get it placed on, and the downstream implications of that. Um, and so the, uh, and then and then of course who's going to cover it, and unfortunately this can vary widely. Um, it, it isn't systematic. You know, once you've talked to one pair, you've talked to one pair. So you really have to have a team of people out there with a nice crisp evidence dossier with a nice um, frying pan to the face narrative to go with that evidence dossier, taking it to these. Um, payers and key opinion leaders. And early and often, like you don't have to have the evidence fully developed in order to engage a payer and be like, hey, I know I'm, you know, I'm only, you know, just getting started on my clinical trial, um, wanted to give you an update on what we're doing. You know, this is when we anticipate it being done and, and just kind of, you know, be there and reminding them about your product and how responsible you're being about your product and the evidence generation around it. Um, Medicare works by um, MACs, which are um, Medicare administrative carriers. And they're, I, I should know this number, I'm gonna say 12, 15 MACs in the country. Um, so they, they cover big regions of the United States. Um, but each one has their own coverage determination process. And um, it is possible to get an NCD, a national coverage determination. Um, it doesn't happen that often. It is possible, um, but that would that would actually cover all of the MACs at once. But usually what you have to do is go to each one of these MACs and um, submit your evidence and um, uh, obtain a coverage determination that way. There are also evidence review entities like Hayes and ECRI and Evidence Street um, who do evidence reviews as well. And um, the payers use those, some more than others. Um, a lot of payers, private payers, will actually, you know, they, they'll only do peer-reviewed literature and maybe only use Hayes and Ecri to, you know, kind of validate their, their reviews, but not as their primary source. Um, then the private payers usually will negotiate their rates based on some factor of the Medicare fee schedule. So that Medicare pricing determination that you get is, does have implications when you're also trying to go into the commercial market. So it's important to get that right. Um, Medicaid, I have to be honest, in my 25 years, although we all talk about we want to do Medicaid, like it is so complicated. Um, this Each state has its own unique Medicare system and Medicare laws. Um, and so it really does take a lot of resources to um, kind of champion in a new technology uh, to get Medicaid coverage. Um, it re really has to be done almost by lobbying on each Capitol Hill, um, you know, for each intended use of, of your technology. Um, and then, you know, 
everybody wants to avoid any kind of friction in the ordering process. And um, so prior authorizations are often a concern. Um, these things can be more automated and reviewed if your CPT code um, can clearly be matched up to a um, ICD-10 code, right? So I can clearly tell what test is being done and it's got eligibility criteria in the policy. And I can tell by the ICD-10 alone what should what should be colored. That can be automated. Um, and in those cases, you're less likely for prior authorizations unless there's concern about, um, you know, misordering of the test or or um, fraudulent coding where they're trying to kind of catch that up front as well. So um, those are the kinds of things that can trigger a prior authorization and anybody who's helping you develop a coding coverage and reimbursement strategy will be, you know, kind of keenly aware of everybody's desire to avoid that trigger. But it is definitely something that you need to think about as you're developing your go-to-market strategy. So uh, this is my last slide in, in, in summary. This kind of combines everything that I was just saying together on this. It's not just an evidence journey and it's not just enough to have evidence. Um, you have to be able to tell that story well and articulately and support each claim with evidence. You have to be, make sure you're solving a real problem in medicine and that, that that care gap is you know significant and that you can your device can actually impact um, that change in care and uh, insert yourself into that marketplace. Um, there's also the, the ability to, um, at the end of the journey, uh, after you've already got coverage and adoption, um, you can uh, you know, try to watch the behavior of your device in the wild and identify any implementation blockers and um, you know, put resources towards unblocking those um, implementation gaps. And so those are all the types of things that you need to consider when you are bringing a medical device from product concept through widespread adoption and coverage. Thanks very much for your time.